Good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you are listening, either through Facebook Live or through this Zoom platform. I'm Hans Brennings. I'm the executive director of the European Environment Agency, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the first of a series of debates on the important issue of COVID-19 uh, and the environment. And together with the network of environmental protection agencies in Europe, the European Environment Agency has taken the initiative to have high level debates on the important issues that connect the COVID-19 crisis to uh, the environment. And today we will kick off the series with two prominent speakers, Hans Mommas, who is the Director General of the Dutch PBL, the Assessment Agency for the Environment, and Dirk Messner, who is the president of uh, the Umweltbundesamt in Germany, the German Environmental Protection Agency. I wish to let the audience know that uh, indeed we are live streaming this debate, but it will also be recorded. You will have the opportunity to ask questions, which you can either uh, pose on social media or through the Zoom Q&A function, and we have staff that will go through the questions to sort them for the debate. Without further ado, since we only have an hour, I would like to uh, frame the first debate as followed. We all know, uh, without giving examples, that the corona measures have really uh, had an enormous economic impact in Europe and throughout the world. And that has led uh, national authorities to take two sorts of economic responses. One, you could say, were the immediate financial support and economic mitigation measures to support workers that lost their job or small businesses to keep them open. But the attention has shifted more and more to longer term stimulus packages. And many of those stimulus packages at national level, but also European level, have a clear promise or at least political commitment to sustainability. We want to create the economy of the future and stimulate that. A green recovery language is used, and often <clears throat> there is reference to the European Green Deal. And today we want to listen and learn from two examples of prominent EPAs that have played a role in national debates and processes. And I would like to ask Dirk Messner of uh, the Umweltbundesamt in Germany to take the floor and uh, shed his light on this connection and how your agency has played a role uh, in the knowledge base that can support this type of recovery package. Dirk, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hans, for your kind remarks. And I would like to drive directly into the presentation, which you will hopefully see in a second, Gürtchen. And please move us directly to the first real slide. So what I'm interested in and what I would like to talk about is whether we do have a chance to link the sustainability transformations we are all interested in with fighting the social and economic impacts of the corona crisis with Hans already mentioned. No? So I will talk about some German experiences, some European perspectives, but also some global concerns which I have. The first slide is here. Please look on the left hand side on the blue curve. What you can see here is comparing the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 with the COVID crisis then in 2020, we can uh, identify easily that the impacts of the, the economic impacts of the COVID crisis for the global economy is even severe. No? So this is an important fact and starting point. Virgin, let's go to the next slide. And on the right hand side of the second slide, you can see unemployment rates and how unemployment rates have been changing and look at those data and the, the shifts towards more unemployment. What we can also say is, and I'm coming back to this point from a sustainability perspective, perspective is that COVID is a driver of inequalities. And COVID is a drive of inequalities within our countries, but also globally. And as sustainability is a concept which brings together economic, social and environmental issues, this is important data. And we as environment agencies need to take in, 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 to, into our minds that fighting climate change and sustainability, ecological sustainability issues needs to be brought together with uh, social impacts and, and fighting the social impacts of the COVID crisis, with, which are severe in many countries, also in the European context. 
So let's move to the next uh, slide then. Uh, my main message here is that anyway, the stimulus packages Hans mentioned already will have an impact on sustainability transformations for good or for bad, because we are talking about the largest uh, stimulus package in the history of human beings. It's much, it is much larger than the stimulus packages which we have been seeing in 2008 and 2009. The data are showing us that something between 10 to 20 trillion US dollars will be invested from now on during the next 18 to 25 months to fight the social and economic impacts of the Corona crisis. So we could do this from a green perspective, from a sustainability perspective. We could also invest this kind of money into the old structures and move backwards, actually. Uh, this is uh, the, the challenge. No? So how to accelerate the transformation towards sustainability with these huge amount of money? And do we have a chance to do so? Next slide, Gürtchen. And the next slide demonstrates, or in the next slide, I want, want to mention that we have good research, actually. Uber did this kind of research on uh, the combination of green instruments and measures and investments with employment efforts. No? So there is good evidence that we can combine this. In 2008 and 2009, what we saw is that during the financial crisis, sustainability issues and climate change is issues and risk disappeared in the public debates. And the investments which we got have been focused on growth and growth and growth and employment and employment, employment, forgetting that we are in the middle of an ecological crisis. So in 2008 and 2009, no link between or no major link between fighting the impact of the financial crisis and sustainability transformations. Next slide, please. And here is an optimistic uh, point of view. Uh, I'm arguing that 2020 differs substantially from 2008 and 2009. And I'm basing this kind of statement on an analysis which, which we did and a synthesis which we did, looking into 120 German, European and global studies on how to fight the social and economic impacts of the corona crisis. And the astonishing result is that you find currently in this crisis, and this is a difference to the 2008 and 9 crisis, very few reports, wherever you look at China, Latin America, Europe, the United States, very few serious um, evidence-based um, advisory reports where sustainability recovery is not at the center. So what we can say here is that three the results from our study, what we can say here is first, uh, most actors in the field doing advisory work accept sustainability as a gold system. This is number one. Number two is that if you look into these reports, you can learn, learn about the main components of sustainability-oriented recovery programs. You can see here five components around the gold system. I will come back to those in a second. Thirdly, which I'm going to uh, elaborate on a bit. Thirdly, in these different reports, and then if you look into the practices of recovery programs, some of the elements of these components of green recovery stimulus packages are more emphasized than others. And I will come back to this more emphasized than others uh, in a second. Let's go to the next slide. We also looked, and I brought um, this cover page from The Economist with me, I, we also looked into um, business media, private sector oriented media. So in the, in the European context, The Economist or Financial Times, in the German context, The Handelsblatt, and what we saw is that this time, in this crisis, the debate on recovery programs focused a lot on green recovery, climate protection, investments into sustainable, sustainable infrastructure. This differs from 2008 and 2009. So this is a change, an important change. Now, the gold system is accepted, I would argue, also in the private sector, towards sustainability transformations. The next slide, please, Gürtchen. So this is a more mixed picture then. These are estimates where, where the money will really be invested. Uh, I'm not sure about the data here and how I'm not sure what will really appear during the next months to come. Uh, the picture is the following. The picture is, if you look to the right hand side, European countries mainly invest in green or at least emphasizing the green elements. And then many other countries, which you can see here, doing much less in the green area and focusing on traditional brown growth concepts. I'm not sure. So I'm a bit skeptical around the data. I know a bit the Chinese context. I know a bit the Canadian context. I would suppose that at the end of the day, the picture will be more mixed. 
But what we can take out of this kind of uh, diagram is that the European perspective and debate which we are having in our investment packages are different from many other regions in the world. So when it comes to green transformation and linking it, it, it to the fighting our uh, impacts of the corona crisis, uh, Europe is special. You know? Europe is special in the sense that we are trying to make this link. Let's move to the next slide, Gretchen. We did a study at Uber on um, recovery programs and recovery investments for Germany. And we suggested to the government to combine three major elements, which you can see in this architecture here. In the middle, investment fields. No? It's about mobility, energy, decarbonizing the transport sector, etc. And we explained in our study where we should invest. No? The second element is then what we emphasize very strongly, so structural reforms for sustainability transformations. This is about supporting local authorities because they need to implement all these kind of things. This is about social ecological tax reforms because this, this drives long-term impacts of investments uh, in ecological sectors. And what we saw in all these reports is that this second dimension is much less emphasized. So most reports accept the gold system of going green and sustainable. Structural reforms which are needed towards sustainability transformation is something which is still not high on the agenda. Our third element here is then on the, uh, on the top, the roof, no? the European Green Deal, because we argue that if we don't get Europe right, we don't get Germany right. And if you don't get Europe right, we, don't can, we cannot shape the global agendas towards sustainability transformations. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the structure of the German stimulus package. No? It is 130 billion euros, what we are talking about here, and three observations. No? The first observation is 40 billion of these 130 billion, is, billion are going into green sectors. So it is about hydrogen, it is about artificial intelligence for climate protection, it is about electric cars, it, it is about local public transportation. So we would have expected even more, of course, but 40 billion, not so bad. No? Second observation, there are also investments which we would not have liked to see as Uber is an environment agency. No? You see Lufthansa here on the right hand side, 9 billion euros to stabilize the company. We are fine with stabilizing the company, no? but we suggested to do it as France did it. No? So link green conditionality with investments to stabilize uh, private companies. No? This has not happened in the German case. A third uh, observation in the German, regarding the German package is structural reforms, which I talked about beforehand, missing. No? So a mixed picture in the German uh, context, and uh, I would be interested how this looks like in, in other countries of the year regarding the European Union. Dirk, Dirk yeah. I, we have to be conscious of time. So yeah. uh, you have a couple more minutes, but then okay. I, I will have to... Uh... Yeah, let you. No, I, I will be very brief and uh, quick during the next because I will focus only on the component, what we learned from the analysis of 120 reports on the main, main components. No? So let's drive through the main components now. Uh, the first element is next slide, Gürtchen. The relevant, there is a consensus on the most relevant investment fields. You can see those here. No? It is mobility, it is buildings, it is energy. This is not new for us, it's uh, business as usual. No? So there is a consensus on the action fields and investment fields. No? Next step. And we go to the next slide uh, directly. As I already, next slide directly. Next one, please, Gretchen. We see in, the, in many of the 120 reports which we analyzed and in practice no, that these structural reforms are not taken seriously. And we could recommend to emphasize this much more because this defines future patterns and long-term investment shifts. No? So there is a weakness here in the reports and there is a weakness here in real investments. Number three, we are suggesting and also learning from the uh, it's 120 reports. We need to move to the next slide, please, Gürtchen. We are suggesting that we should green all recovery measures. So what we are suggesting is having something like a sustainability check, and at Uber we are working on this, for any kind of stimulus measures which we see now in the corona context. This is element number three. Element number four, this is the next slide is, we are suggesting also for the European context, Hans, we discussed this, no? that we needed a reporting and monitoring system 
to get learning processes right and transparency into the system. Well, we are talking a lot about sustainability investments. Are we doing this? No? So monitoring and, and reporting is element number four. And element number five, and this is mentioned in most of the reports, but needs to take it as serious as possible, bringing together the social dimension and the environmental dimensions is absolutely key because for many people and many vulnerable, vulnerable groups in our societies, the Corona crisis implies a huge uh, a ch a challenge. My last slide and my last sentence. No? Uh, I have been participating in many global debates during the last month. So yesterday with Latin America, con my Latin American con uh, colleagues, days before with Chinese colleagues. So three points here regarding Europe. Now the first one is that we could be a role model here. We could shape basic structures in our economies in Europe towards sustainability. And based on that, we could trigger also global trade patterns and global investment patterns. So as you saw beforehand, other regions are not with the same emphasis moving into this direction. Number two, we have been learning that in Europe, the 750 billion recovery package and driving these investments mainly towards the weaker economies is a precondition for sustainability transformations across Europe. So social solidarity is a basic mechanism for making sustainability transformations happen. And the last point, I'm arguing again in, in, in discussions with my own government, and I would like to see this on the European level uh, the same way, we should invest much more in supporting globally sustainability transformations as an answer to the corona crisis, because globally in most developing countries, this will not happen otherwise. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dirk, uh, for this uh, very rich and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And, and I know that when I go in through your slides in detail and also to the reports and the study that you've done, I, I will find a wealth of information. Hans, over yeah. to you now. You are the Secretary General of the Dutch PBL, the Assessment Bureau. I, I know that you play a significant role in the Dutch debate on sustainability, how to bring uh, decarbonization into a socio-economic discussion. So you have a lot of experience in bringing this type of debates to the table. Please guide us through the Dutch example now. Over to you. Right. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you for inviting me. I'm trying to share my presentation with you. In fact, I, I followed a slightly different pattern in my presentation. I take it uh, slightly more from an operational perspective. So I think content-wise, we, we end up in the same type of analysis, but my, my approach will much more be from, from an organizational perspective, how we as an organization have tried to tackle this corona crisis, which, which immediately also involves yourself with running an organization, running an agency, and, and trying to organize your work differently. So I, t I take you through a few questions which were posed to us uh, by the organizers, and, and uh, I think I will go very quickly through the organizational ones and then, then sort of pay more attention with the more substantive ones. So how does this pandemic impact our work? I mean, what, was, what were positive experiences and what were negative experiences? I mean, what, what, what really I think, I think astonished us all was the resilience of society under pressure. How much things can change in a very brief period of time. The way in which uh, uh, home office uh, uh, collaboration was changed, our mobility patterns were changed, it was tremendous, absolutely tremendous. So, so if, if a society is under pressure and there is something of a collective urgency, we can make big changes. And also as an agency, we made those big changes because we had to reorganize our work also. And that in a certain sense proved itself to be very successful. So, so our organization also itself was able to reorganize its work very actively. But then this crisis also has sh shown us some very bad things. And, and, and from the perspective of the Netherlands, there are three, four things I would like to mention. The fragility of the healthcare system, absolutely vital. I mean, we, we've been, we have been uh, uh, shallowing down that healthcare system and, and, as, and as soon as we needed it, you know, we, we discovered that it wasn't strong enough. We also learned something about self-employed labor, the fragility of self-employed labor. When, as you were saying, Derek, the COVID crisis is really also increasing social inequality. 
and we've, we've learned something about the weaker sides of our labor market. And there was this other small thing which was, was there all of a sudden, the resurrection of national borders. All of a sudden, the virus was Chinese or Italian, but it was even Flemish uh, at some moment of time. And we could have a Dutch virus also. And borders were erected again to keep people out because of their virus uh, and infectious uh, uh, diseases. So, you know, as an organization, we have to reorganize our work uh, uh, and, and people are, are aware of that. And I think, I think in the end, you know, this is also about finding uh, some resilience in that situation. So what kind of challenges have we experienced so far? I mean, as an organization, I go, go through this very quickly. Of course, organizing coherence, commitment within the organization. Of course, finding a new balance between home and office work. I mean, I mean people are still working majority from home, and then we still have to be productive as, as an agency. Reorganizing our working program, all of a sudden, you know, the world was different and we had to reorganize what we were working about uh, to rethink uh, what our plans were for the coming uh, months to work on. We had to reorganize our office space and it was a challenge to maintain the coherence between co-workers within the organization. So that, that, that from an organizational perspective. Then let's go to, you know, the topical field, the green recovery. What, what, what you did very quickly, because, and that resonates the fact that this is not just a green crisis, it's a, a predominantly, it's a healthcare crisis, and then there's a socioeconomic crisis. And then on top of that, there is, there's a green crisis. So what we did as, as national assessment agencies, both the, the, the ecological one, PBL, and CPB, the economic assessment agency, and the social cultural assessment agency, we sat together because we wanted to establish something of a broad assessment scheme, which was not only focusing on green issues, but which also took socioeconomic issues on board. And we very quickly published a policy report arguing for something of a broader welfare assessment scheme to be brought into the debate. So what kind of schemes were, will, will be developed for the near future? Our argument is that we have to assess that through a triple P perspective to look both at economic and social and ecological uh, perspectives and, and values in there. And then you, know, you see this, this tension between small short-term recovery strategy, which is focusing on G GNP and the long-term recovery strategies, will, which is looking at the sustainability of your earning capacities. And we're still in the middle of that debate between low, small, short-term perspectives and broader long-term perspectives and the way in which these have to be organized within public policy making. So currently we are focusing on an acceleration of the established green agenda. And we're very much also arguing for, for linking it to existing policy schemes. So that means climate change, that means agriculture, food and biodiversity, that means uh, the circular economy, that means urbanization patterns but at the same time doing that within a broader welfare assessment framework. So go beyond single issue advocacy, go beyond a, a green recovery, make it turn it into a broader welfare strategy, which includes the green agenda in a broader socioeconomic strategy. So what are the, what are the, you know, what are the opportunities here? looking at it from a Dutch perspective that I'm looking to Europe and what Europe is doing and looking at global developments. I think one, one major issue here is that, you know, we have to build a strong EU level playing field. I, th I think the, 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 green, uh, the green agenda, uh, the green recovery agenda is vital there. But what's also vital is our few instruments where, which are already there in the established uh, policy packages. The ETS system has to be strengthened. The debate now about the 2030 CO2 target moving towards 55% is crucial, crucial to find, to establish something of a level playing field. This carbon border tax policy has to be established so that in a, in a sense also companies can, can feel themselves safe within the, the confines in which they're working. Uh, we have to have that 30% green contribution level as a European measure. 
not just on a, on a European level, but also on a national level. And I see that Germany, both and France, are following that 30% green contribution level. And then there is the green taxonomy, which is also vital. So, so in a sense, what we need is something of a European green level playing field to be able to draw that into our national uh, uh, landscape so that from, from there onwards, we can build a strong green recovery policy also on a national level. And in doing so, we have to take a few points of attention into our, our, uh, our agendas. It's not just about green recovery. It's a wider socio-economic agenda we have to face. It's about reorganizing labor markets. It's about reschooling. I mean, we can, we can mobilize a lot of money to, to, to establish something of a green strategy for building markets, for infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. But we need people to do it. And, and you know, in, in a certain sense, we have to reorganize labor markets to do that. So we, we will also need a very strong labor market schooling policy to get people to the right corners of the, of the market and to the right corners of the labor market to do the job. That green agenda should also be a, a social justice agenda. So who, who's going to pay the burden of this green recovery uh, and who's not? And then we have to have cross-national collaboration because we can't do it just on a national level. We need cross-national collaboration on the energy transition. We need it on resource use strategies. We need cross-national modal shifts in, in the use of infrastructures, mobility infrastructures. So we need, I think, something of a cross-national collaboration to really face the issue at, at stake. Lessons learned. A few lessons learned. I mean, what, what we as an agency have learned uh, very strongly now is that we really have to collaborate uh, uh, on, on different levels of policymaking. And we really have to breathe between small scale and, and long scale, broader scale strategies. We, we both uh, have to be involved in the policymaking process and at the same time stay in our own corner where we have to do the assessments. We have to bring knowledge at the table but at the same time do a lot of more of interdisciplinary work. We have to collaborate with other assessment agencies to get to integrated assessment schemes. And we have to collaborate with policymakers because they have to move back and forward between operational crisis-based policies and more strategic long-term policies. At this moment in the Netherlands, the green agenda is not self-evident. Uh, people are primarily focused on social and economic issues. And we still have to give the message very clearly that for the long-term social and economic recovery, we need also a green agenda. Because otherwise, that, that recovery will not be sustainable in the different meanings of that word. Not just in the, the green terms, but also in socio-economic terms, it will not be sustainable. We need a much more stronger focus on the future. So we have to prevent single issue advocacy here, and we need to take something of an inclusive approach. So, you know, a lot of people have commented on, you know, this, this is a window of opportunity. This is really where we have to take the turn towards a greener future. And I think there is an opportunity because people have experienced a more silent, clean, resilient uh, environment. They've experienced uh, clean air, They've experienced quiet cities. So yes, uh, 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 there is this idea of a better future. But at the same time, there's the reality of a rebound tendencies. And, and you know, there, there was a, a global report being published today in which you can see that CO2 emissions are back to normal again. So, so we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think that you know, this, this green future will be produced by itself. No, no, we have to really face uh, uh, the difficult task of bringing the correct messages to the floor. Hence, we have a small window of opportunity, but that will quickly vanish, and we have to make use of that small window of opportunity. So we're still working as an organization under a working at home regime, but ongoingly, we have to reorganize our work to stimulate and explore different perspectives. We have informal gatherings, we have strategic groups that meet. We have task forces that, task forces that are 
able to, 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 to meet the challenges we, we have to face today. And this also counts for all international activities. I mean, we don't absolutely travel not as much as we did before. Everything is organized now on a digital scale at our organization. At the moment in the Netherlands, there is a discussion about a growth fund. Uh, we're discussing an investment fund of around 20 billion euros. The money is to be spent in form five tranches of each four billions per year. And we, the, the idea is to have something of a high level committee which will decide about these investments. And there are three lines of investment that they're exploring at the moment, which is about industry, knowledge, and sustainability. And the focus is on R&D, innovation, and infrastructure. And the primary goal here is to, to get us to a sustainable earning capacity. So the way in which this money will be spent is still very much a subject of debate. And it's not sure yet whether that money will be spent in, on green recovery. So the debate is still going on and we still have to build a strong case for a green sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, uh, for an equally rich uh, presentation. And I think the two uh, went very well together with also more, uh, I would say, introspection and sharing how you have been uh, organizing around uh, these things. Um, it's clear that both of you look at this recovery as, a, as an element of socioeconomic recovery, but with boundary conditions of sustainability that should be guaranteed and strong and that actually make it sustainable over a longer period of time. It's clear that uh, there is a lot of serious thought going into what you have been doing and there is a lot of knowledge out there, but I have one follow-up question for both of you. Looking at your national context and at everything you've brought to the table, can you give us an, an idea of how much impact you've had as knowledge places on the national debate and, and how, what are the conduits of uh, having impact in that type of debates when it's about so much money and about such interests and about the urgency also of dealing with people's income and salaries and and uh, environmental sector. So where is the impact coming from? What are the key elements of that? Ooh. Dirk. Yeah, so two, three points, Hans. The first one is that uh, the, the first three months, uh, three weeks after the Corona crisis started, the lockdown mid-March, it became silent around us. I mean, journalists not any longer calling because no one was interested in environment and climate. No? And with, this was exactly my fear because I, I was a policy advisor also in 2008 and 2009 when all our issues disappeared from the national agenda. So our reaction to that at Uber was we need to make our voices heard you know? and we need to, to, we need to do our own work with partners on what Hans Olio, Hans Mummers, you also mentioned, you know? a sustainability oriented recovery approach, not a, not a narrow-minded green one, but because we need to take into consideration that there are huge social and economic impacts. You know? So uh, making our voices heard and start working on these issues. Second point, we work together with partners beyond our sustainability spectrum. So we, we have been cooperating with the Fraunhofer Institute for Innovation and uh, in innovation economics in Karlsruhe you know, um, with their knowledge and combining this with our knowledge. And we have been presenting our study how we would like to see emerging an architecture for a green sustainability oriented recovery project for Germany. We presented it in a national press conference with colleagues from Fraunhofer and a chief economist of a bank no? Mm -hmm. to make clear that this is now, this, is, this should be the new normal no? and so this should be the orientation for the private sector also. So, uh, these are two elements which, which okay. has been proven, uh, which have been proven effective. Hans Dirk has uh, mentioned the, the collaboration and, and you mentioned the collaboration between the three assessment agencies, which yeah. I think is rather unique. And, and the Dutch are well known to be exporters of governance models. This almost <laughs> sounds like a governance model for integrated assessment work. Can you say a bit more on that? Well, it, it, it's something which is still under development. It's, it's not just as if we have something of an architecture just lying on the table which we can use because, because this is very complicated. In fact, 
before COVID uh, exploded, this, this debate on, on broader welfare assessment perspectives uh, was already there. There was already in, in the wider political field in the Netherlands a discussion about we should not just be talking about GDP, we should also be talking about a, a broader sort of welfare scheme in which ecological issues and social issues are on the table. But as you know, we, we, we at a currently we have, we have a, a, a center right wing coalition from Christian Democrats and liberals. Uh, so, so it's not self evident that th this is taken on board. But at the same time, that coalition is depending also on, on left wing parties because there is no majority in, in, our, our, in, in our commons. So th there is this back and forth between, between different, a very sort of fragmented policy agenda. And, and I see that all, always as a window of opportunity because, because within a politically highly fragmented environment, you know, that there is, there is room for a, a wider assessment of policymaking. So we already had this discussion about the broader welfare perspective brought to the center of policymaking in the Netherlands. And then there was COVID. So in a certain sense, COVID is stressing the importance to integrate socioeconomic and green recovery strategies. But now we have to be careful that, that you know, this, this green element is not falling off the road. Yeah? So, 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 you know, at the moment, there is a, a lot of stress on socioeconomic developments. But then we say, you know, these the socioeconomic developments will not be sustainable if not taking into account also the consequences in relation to you know, climate change, uh, nitrogen uh, agendas, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what we get here is, is that we play a role by stressing the fact that a socioeconomic recovery on which you spend billions and billions of euros will not be sustainable if you don't take into account environmental issues. Yeah, I think that, that message is, is clear. Rather than now going to a second round of questions with you, I would like to ask the colleagues from the European Environment Agency whether we have received questions from our online audiences. So, Gulchin and Constant, over to you. Thank you, Hans. Um, so here I represent the audience. We've got some live viewers. If you do have questions, additional questions, please share them in the chat or on Facebook. So far, uh, I can present two questions. One is from our social media uh, audience and Todd is asking, let me just uh, read his question. Um, one second. Where is it? Yes. How realistic is, is it that the EU's recovery will be green, even if this has been high on the agenda until now? Want more tangible issues for citizens like jobs quickly become the priority as the economic fallout really starts to bite? So this is a question about, uh, yes, we have, we and the two of you have been with great, uh, you know, energy been promoting a certain integration and, and a forward looking perspective on, on sustainable welfare models. Huh? Uh, but how realistic is it that we can break and bend the trend uh, through this type of investments, Dirk? Yeah, I, I would have two answers or two aspects. The first one is I mentioned that this time, even in private sector oriented business media, no, the goal system is absolutely clear. Uh, it is towards climate protection and sustainability transformation. I showed you the, the first page of, of The Economist. No? You might have read this wonderful editorial of the chief editors of Financial Times a few days after the, the short shutdown, no? now it's time for climate protection. I could have written this. No? So mm. something has been changing there. This is not a minor thing because last time, only 10 years ago, 2008 and 2009, all of that disappeared. No? The second element is then for good reasons and we, we, we saw the 750 billion euro package, uh, euro package of Europe, the European Commission. No? And a larger part of this will go to weaker economies to support much more difficult reforms in those countries than Hans in the Netherlands or Germany. No? Because countries which start, which start with a higher rate of unemployment and a higher public deficit, of course, have more problems and more challenges and trouble to make these large investments towards 
sustainability happen? No? I listened to these kind of voices yesterday with my Latin American colleagues. No? So that we are having now these 750 billion euro package helped us to overcome the risk of a divide in Europe around sustainability transformations being based on these uh, inequalities within the continent, right? Okay, Hans? Yeah, there, there is one big danger here, and that is that, that the green agenda is forced to take the burden of the entire socioeconomic problem. And the green agenda will not be able to do that. So, so, so we have to build packages. We have to build packages uh, in which uh, green strategies are a part of a wider package, which also includes socioeconomic uh, uh, policy lines. Because otherwise, because otherwise we really are overstressing the green agenda and it will not be able to deliver all the promises. But that would be a big mistake, I think. Hmm. And that's why we need integrated packages. And that's why I think this, this basic line of having the 30%, you know, the 30% of the recovery fund being spent on climate or green issues. And then there is room for other issues which are also on the table, like socioeconomic justice, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that's a good approach to the issue. So, that, so there is a clear self-interest there for the green agenda to relate itself to a broader socioeconomic agenda. Mm -hmm. If I, if I may, uh, in, in my role as uh, director of the European Environment Agency, I think one of the, the elements that, that will drive uh, national agendas is indeed the European Green Deal and the connection between the European stimulus package, which is significant in, of, in and of itself, on top of the investment package in the European Green Deal. So it, it's, it's a needle on the compass that was not there just a year ago. Uh, and I think that makes one big difference. If we would be operating in a European vacuum when it comes to the policy objectives there and, and the high ambitions, it would probably uh, lead to a very different national uh, type of debate. Yeah? And that's, you want to come in there? And that's also where the situation, the current situation is totally different from the situation in 2008, 2009. Yeah. Mm. Because in 2008, 2009, we didn't have that kind of policy framework. No, neither on the national level nor on the EU level. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a few things coming together. A stronger public sector, the conviction everywhere that we have to invest ourselves out of this crisis. And the third element is we have the policies already there. Yeah. So, so it's much more easy today to build that into a strong policy fra framework. Okay, thanks. Gulchin, over to you for the... Yes, Dirk, George, the next only, question. No, we, we, do, we do have much better knowledge now about the co-benefits between green investments, employments, and uh, social challenges and, and sustainability orientations. No? We have been working a lot about these kind of issues during the last 10 years, and this knowledge can now be translated into integrated policy packages, as Hans said. Yeah. Gulchin. Yes, I actually have a question as well, because this is um, something that we've been following from the communication side and receiving questions over the last uh, few weeks since the COVID crisis has started. It's about the impacts of certain lifestyle habits, like single-use plastics, for example. So there was an EU legislation about you know, reducing the use, banning them in certain cases. Now, with all the protected gear, for example, then we actually see more of these uh, equipments in entering the markets or being used. The same kind of thing about avoiding uh, public transport during rush hours, etc. There is some discussion, not necessarily documented, about uh, more people taking their private cars uh, for mobility reasons. So what do you think that the impacts both in the short term and also long term, uh, these, uh, I would say, indications could have? Okay, Hans, uh, do you want to take a first step at this one? And let's try to keep the answer short because, Gulchin, there are questions from the audience as well. Yes, Hans? We, we, we did a study on, on um, one, one of the studies we did in the context of this, this COVID uh, uh, issue is, is that we did a study on mobility patterns and the way in which, you know, uh, more people working at home will change mobility patterns. 
and what kind of labor market segments are influencing these mobility packages. And, and it was very clear that, you know, with, with a minor shift, with a minor shift in the way people organize their labor time, uh, it, we, we were already possible, it's already possible to really sort of put much less thresh, stress or pressure on mobility, mobility uh, infrastructures. And we see that already happening now. So, so, so we see now that people are shifting around with their time labor pattern, which, which, which implies that, you know, also within traffic jams, they have disappeared. So, so all of a sudden, that's no longer an issue. And, but but the, the, the great crisis, the great issue is really public transport at the moment. So how do we get people's trust in public transport back again? I think that will take a longer time to, to really organize that. All right, Dirk, anything from your side? Only one, one thought, no? I mean, we have additional money now in the German context to invest in electrification of cars and, and infrastructure around it. This is directly going into green issues, no? The money which is going into our train system uh, currently, the railway system, it's only for, for, for avoiding the implosion of the company itself, the Deutsche Bahn. No? This is not about green investment, it's about survival. No? Mm. So the public, sec the public transport sector is in a very difficult situation. And this is costing us, us a lot of money. No? Yeah. Okay. If I could share two more questions that we've yep. just received from uh, Facebook, I'll just share them with you at, at one go. From Muge, when it comes to sustainability discussion and green recovery, it's often debated that we need transformative transitions that need innovation in a bigger scale, more new collaboration and thinking outside the box. What are your comments about governmental agencies' role for the need of, for innovation, transformative transitions and green recovery? That's one question. Mm -hmm. The second one uh, from Eduardo, in my opinion, the problem of sustainable concept is that it has not been very clear cut or understood by everyone in the same way. With excessive frequency, uh, it's mixed with economic sustainability and environmental um, sustainability, I believe, does not take into account the term sustainability too many times, tends to obtain results in the short term when the natural phenomena are used to be on a long-term basis. How can they integrate both points of view and agendas must be uh, accompanied by electric, uh, electoral cycles? Yeah. Okay, Hans. Yeah, well, let, let's take the last one because, because yeah. that's an interesting one. Uh, um, of course, you, you can, you can um, take the, the, the broad meaning of sustainability and the ambivalent meaning as a problem. But you can also turn that into an opportunity in a sense that, you know, uh, uh, if, if there's talk about uh, having a, a sustainable economic development, you can turn that into an awareness that the sustainable economic development will not be possible if the wider environmental uh, uh, challenges will not be taken on board. I mean, I mean uh, there is a clear uh, conscience everywhere that we have to decarbonize our economy, that we have to electrify the economy. Uh, and that's that's also something which is which is absolutely included in the agenda of sustainable economic development, and that's also already taken into account by the private sector, because there are already uh, uh, thoughts about innovative transformational strategies to get away from the old carbon economy towards something which is either hydrogen or biogas based, bio based or electrified, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, and then, you know, you have to start to think about the infrastructures you need to make that economic transformation possible. And I think, I think yes, uh, uh, the ambivalence of the word sustainability can be a trap. But at the same time, it, also, it might also be an opportunity to explore and, and to see whether you can build a, a, a really environmental sustainability into also an economic sustainability issue. Dirk? Mm -hmm. I would take the first question then. It was on yeah. governance, no? And <laughs> yes. uh, it's, so recovery is not only about investments. The recovery, the recovery is about governance. No? My first observation here in Germany, it was an important debate that we argued that we can only in, in implement these amounts of money if we also invest in the implementation and planning capabilities of our local authorities, no? which has been shrinking over the last years. This has been happening also in many other European countries. So a first observation. Second observation, 
we need transformative governance structures towards long-term sustainability transformations. And this is in most countries, also in the German case, not happening. This is what I said. No? These structural reforms, Hans, you also talked about taxonomy, mm -hmm. labor markets towards sustainability. This is not happening still. No? Maybe my last sentence, we have a chance on the European level because Hans Breunings, as you said, no? We have the Green Deal package on the table, which is about transformation of institutional and policy packages. No? And if you would link this with the stimulus packages, the 750 billion, we would have a chance to, to bridge these two worlds uh, in the European context. Hmm. Yeah, if I, if I can add two sentences here, I think the question in essence was also, can public institutions be agents of change, of, of fundamental systemic transitions that, that are needed. And I would say, uh, well, the, 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 the three of us, I think, are at least leading institutions which have a tradition of putting that type of debates uh, on the agenda of describing mechanisms uh, of illustrating it with, with serious uh, methodology and, and with serious data. So th there is within the public sector clearly the potential to move in that direction. The, I think what, what the Green Deal is attempting to do is to bring it to the heart of what we regard as socioeconomic policy making in Europe and, and make, it, make it sort of the driver of uh, the broader agenda that, that we are facing. So we can only hope that public institutions indeed can be agents of change and drivers of uh, of change uh, by putting needles on the compass there, by, by tax reform, by spending public money in the right direction, and by setting frameworks of governance like Dirk said, that, that also drive the, the private sector uh, into a, a different direction. Hans? Yeah, but also by organizing sticks and carrots. Yeah. Um, because, because in a certain sense, you know, we, we need EU-led assessment schemes on the one hand, to have, to have the sticks there, and we need the recovery funds, you know, the, the just the yeah. just transition and the Green Deal as a carrot, because in a certain sense, you know, uh, that goes along with preconditions which national governments have to take on board to develop their own frameworks. Yeah. yeah. Gulchen, is there another question? Yes, we actually have a couple more. There is one from, again, Facebook follower Caroline. EU trade and tariffs on imported manufacturing goods do favor cheap and not sustainable goods. It's more of a comment on the EU's trade policy. Yeah. And we also have a, a question in uh, Zoom from uh, Almut. Uh, she says, Dirk mentioned the need for monitoring what the impacts of all the recovery measures and investments actually will be. How do you see the role of EPAs in this okay. monitoring? If I could, if I could, because that was also on my list of, of prepared questions. Hans and Dirk, if you could briefly tell us whether there is a monitoring and reporting planned for this green recovery in your countries and what role you would play in that. Is there a dashboard follow-up of this? Because it's a lot of money. There are strong claims made. How will we know whether uh, uh, you know, this, this has actually worked and, and whether it has delivered? Mm -hmm. Dirk. Yeah, we started a debate with the environmental ministry on that and Uber would, would play a role in this if we move into this direction. We suggested to have such a scheme. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, but it is still not decided. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, Hans. Yeah, the same is the case here. Uh, uh, and and we, I, I would prefer to do it as, as assessment agencies together. So, so to have, have something of a broader welfare framework, uh, again, to, to, to not take this into a single issue advocacy, to take it as an, from the beginning as an integrated package. Yeah, I would say the same is true at the European level where uh, there is a discussion about what needs to be in the European semester uh, mm -hmm. package, but also how, how can you have a sort of dashboard approach towards the European Green Deal, because it is also a big investment uh, package that is on the table. Yeah. In the interest of time, we have five minutes. I, I would like to ask uh, Hans and Dirk whether you want to make brief final comments uh, on this idea of green recovery, sustainable recovery, and what you think are the essential elements that, that you would like to focus on. Dirk. Uh, which, I mean, we have been discussing about the 
chances and opportunities in Europe. No? I wanted to re-emphasize again, Hans, what you also mentioned, the crisis of international cooperation. I mean, in 2008 and 2009, what we got was the G20 as a format of heads of state. So more economic and trade and financial markets coordination globally. No? And this time what we saw is nationalism. And I've been talking to two or so many people now from developing and emerging countries. And this is an important part of the global economy and of the global population, obviously. No? And the debate we are having is exceptional from a global perspective, because in most other regions, this debate is not taking place. And we needed European investments, therefore, in this field, you know, in making, for, for triggering sustainability transformation processes in the sense we are discussing it here for Europe in other regions supported by us. You know. This is in our mid and long-term self-interest. And I would emphasize this point strongly. Okay, thank you. Hans? Yeah, the same. I, I, think, I think that the... The big difference between 2008 and, and now is, is that we have a European mission and then within that European mission, the green agenda is a, a very strong case in hand. And I think that that green agenda, the European green agenda, is something of, of, of a mission oriented drive, which is also seeping into the private sector, uh, which collaboratively is, is making something of a common agenda. So that, there's a big difference there. And, and this is a window of opportunity we have to take, because otherwise we will be leaving behind. Glasgow next year will be a moment of truth. And, and yeah. Yeah, we better be ready for that moment of truth, because otherwise we are falling on the, the wrong side of, of, of history in a certain sense. Thank you to, uh, to both of you for, uh, for not only a, a great presentation, but also the insightful comments and, and to the audience as well. I would like to end uh, in the last two minutes with wrapping up, and I, I want to do that in a couple of ways. One is that I think in Europe, we've got a number of places like the PBL, like the Umweltbundesamt, but there are several others where there is very good knowledge and, and serious thought going into these matters and I think it's important that we share the knowledge learn from each other which is exactly why in the network of environmental protection agencies we are doing that and I can guide the audience also to our own website where we make connections to what is happening in Europe and of course also to the the websites of the agencies <coughs> involved so please do that look for the information also it was recorded today so you have insights into the rich presentations that Granted, I asked you to rush through, but uh, there is much more in it than, than the time that you were allowed to speak to them. So look, look into those. Also, we have future debates planned in this series. We've got a debate on uh, a more scientific perspective on the link between uh, COVID-19 and the environment. There is a debate that links to planetary boundaries, the idea that we are in this situation because we have been pushing uh, towards biodiversity loss, ecosystem loss, uh, which is also hotly debated in some circles. The link uh, with public health and whether environmental pressures on our health are an, another get another layer now with COVID-19 and how that relates to each other. Think of air pollution and the impact on how people respond to COVID-19. And of course, also the, the climate change issue, which features hotly and which was mentioned by Hans and also by Dirk in several places. So I would like to invite you to follow also the next debates. You can find all the information on our website. This is a collaborative effort with uh, many of the key players in Europe. Thank you to the audience. Thanks to uh, Dirk and Hans for the great interventions and to the team for facilitating the debate. This concludes this session. Goodbye.